Welcome to our final session for this year's summit, Fireside Chat, the role of homeownership for a thriving neighborhood. We have two brilliant speakers, Colvin Granham and Commissioner Adolfo Kedion, to lead a final discussion on how homeownership, specifically affordable homeownership, plays an integral role in thriving neighborhoods. My final reminder, attendees, you will see a chat box and a Q&A box both directly to the right of this live stream video. Use them to communicate with other attendees and to send questions to our consideration by our moderator. If you are having technical difficulties, click on the red icon in the lower right corner. Okay, let's get this session started. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. I am Pamela Saw. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. And we are honored to have old supporters, new supporters, um, Colvin Granham and Commissioner Adolfo Carrion Jr. with us. Uh, they don't need much introduction, but I'll go through for those of us who aren't as familiar with the details. Colvin Granham was the president and CEO of Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation from May 2001 until June 2022. As many of you heard from Blondell earlier, restoration has brought over $650 million to the community, developed over 2,000 units of affordable housing, and redeveloped Brooklyn's Town Hall and Cultural Center Restoration Plaza. Under Colvin's leadership, Restoration has adopted a new strategic direction focused on closing the racial wealth gap. Colvin serves on the boards of CNYCN since the very inception, as well as LISC, Carver Federal Savings Bank, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and recently served as a member of the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform. Welcome, Colvin. Commissioner Adolfo Carrion Jr. is the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. He served as Deputy Assistant to President Barack Obama and Director of the White House of Office of Urban Affairs and established the White House Urban Policy Working Group. Commissioner Carrion has a long history of public service in New York City, serving as Bronx Borough President and member of the New York City Council. In the Bronx, Commissioner Cavion has shepherded a new era of growth, increasing investments in housing, new businesses, commercial space, and perhaps the most important, the new Yankee Stadium. So thank you from all of us for last <laughs> night. You must have been a good luck charm. I'm taking credit for that. <laughs> he has served as president of the National Association of Latino Elected Officials and is an Aspen Institute Rodell Fellows alumnus. Thank you so much for joining us and for your support. So we're Thank doing you, a fireside chat without the Yule log, but we'll jump right in because we've got about 35 minutes here. I want to start with a question directed to the commissioner. Commissioner, we've heard many thoughtful discussions throughout the summit about the challenges to supporting affordable and equitable housing throughout New York City. Could you tell us about HPD's priorities for addressing these issues, including expansion of the Homeowner Help Desk and Flood Help New York? Oh, uh, sure, Pamela, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be with uh, such a distinguished partner in this conversation, Colvin, who's dedicated his entire career to building community. So appreciate the opportunity to, to share. Uh, and now uh, sitting here in this seat as commissioner of housing for New York City, um, it's it's really a great honor to work with so many of the people who are part of your audience and part of this food chain of trying to make New York City more affordable, family friendly, a city of opportunity for all incomes um, and people who come from all over the world. You know, we're dealing with all sorts of uh, challenges in that regard today, but that's not new to New York. So it's in our DNA to work to make it a more equitable, affordable city so people can thrive in this economy. Um, having said that, look, you know, the principal mission of, of, of this agency 
is to house New Yorkers affordably and to give that opportunity across the spectrum of incomes. We need to produce more housing. Um, it, it is our challenge. And in order to produce more housing, we need to rebuild the housing agency of New York City that, like so many other uh, government institutions and agencies, businesses, it suffered uh, the impact of a global pandemic that uh, impacted the workforce and our capacity to hold on to people. People moved. A, a whole bunch of things happened that reduced the workforce, especially in certain areas that are important for the production of affordable housing. Um, and the folks in this audience know our programs. So our aim in, 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 the, sh in the short run is to rebuild the agency reduce rent burden. Everybody knows uh, who's in this business that half of New Yorkers are paying, uh, you know, 30% 30, uh, 30 of their income for rent um, and barely making it. And about a third of New Yorkers are paying up to 50% of their income for rent. And that the average rent in, in Manhattan right now is in excess of $4,000, $4,500 a month for, for an average apartment. Um, this is a crisis that we have to attend to. So subsidizing the housing to bring the price point down, working with our federal partners to get more aid, and we're working very closely. The Center for New York City Neighborhoods is part of that conversation and advocacy with the federal government, getting more rental assistance into this town, into this city, uh, in the form of Section 8, in the form of uh, you know housing vouchers of all types, those are critical so that we can uh, uh, keep New Yorkers here and make sure that just like my family benefited, Pam, from uh, uh, finding an apartment at Jacob Rees Houses that allowed us to move into a HUD-assisted you know, apartment on 12th Street and Avenue C in Loisaida, and then allowed us to save enough money to, to buy a uh, and I'm, and this is my lead in to buy an affordable home that had an FHA mortgage that allowed us to only put down 3% of, 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 of the asking price. That was the critical help. That's the kind of investment that we need to make today for working families. So my parents, and I'll try to shorten this now, my parents who, who came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s had the opportunity, limited English, you know, sixth grade education coming here, uh, like, like so many others arrived because there was economic crisis in their homeland for a lot of complicated reasons. But here they were in New York City, the big city, two young Puerto Rican kids with starting a family, they were able to step up because the city stepped up and gave them nice public housing. Jacob Rees house, Houses was beautiful when I, when I was growing up as a kid. And and then the opportunities to, to step up. So what we're doing, um, this administration, we've added $44 million to home ownership opportunities. We have a, the, the homeowner help desk, which is a partnership between you guys, a number of other housing partners in central Brooklyn, Southeast Queens, the North Bronx, um, helping local homeowners receive one-on-one -on -one housing, uh, financial, legal uh, counseling and assistant assistance. Um, the, the homeowner help desk does outreach to, to at-risk homeowners, and provides them with education and assistance around scam prevention, deed fraud, um, foreclosure prevention, how to repair your home, estate planning, so that you can pass the wealth that you secured for, for, for your family to the next generation. Often, a lot of families lose that opportunity. They, they don't have a will. So we work this homeowner help desk um, that reached um, hundreds of people now with the new investment that the Adams administration is making is going to be able to reach at least a thousand homeowners annually. And then on top of that, um, and if you haven't seen this, people should should visit our website. It's available on our website uh, uh, digitally, but we've we've published and started distribution of a homeowner handbook. And it's a handbook that you know, sort of sits in tandem with the homeowner help desk or is an extension of the homeowner help desk. And I know you all are very familiar with the handbook um, and thank you all for your help with that. I think you were at the press conference in Brooklyn when we, when we announced it. 
And uh, we also have a program called Home Fix. And this is a home repair program for low and moderate in income homeowners um, that supports about 150 homeowners a year. Sounds like a little in a city of 9 million people, but we are a city of renters and lots of homeowner owners. But the ability to help people uh, fix their homes, you know, maintenance repairs, window replacements, heating plant replacements, hot water, uh, roofing repairs, accessibility needs for people who are older New Yorkers like me, <laughs> who are who are entering that part of uh, uh, that chapter in their life, being able to outfit their homes so that they can safely remain in their homes and in their neighborhoods, because as you probably discussed earlier in your in your talks today, you know, we, we've lost a lot of uh, minority homeowners and black homeowners and brown homeowners in this city. I think it's in, in the in the in the 20,000 number or more. Uh, we have to prevent that. And part of Home Fix is trying to keep people in their homes safely. Um, we work with you all, as you know, with Flood Help New York. Um, for, for sustainability repairs and preparing, you know, in, in the wake of Ida and Superstorm Sandy and all that. So th that's another uh, um, program. And to promote home ownership, you know, the folks probably remember from the 19, late 70s, early 80s, I know Calvin does, the ANCP, the, till, the old TIL program, right? In 1987, when I was in graduate school, I worked on a TIL in uh, Williamsburg. And um, tills are still around. We've done um, a thousand or more units, uh, and I'm sorry, nineteen thousand units uh, over the years. But we still have eighty-one buildings out there, eighty-two buildings out there that need repair. That need that have some of them have tenants in place. Some of them, the tenants have gone and are, and are waiting for closure so that they can move into a co-op that will cost them. Wait for it, $2,500 for an apartment in New York City. And we're trying to educate the council and the people out there in the neighborhoods that this is an amazing opportunity for home ownership in New York. And then I'll stop with this because uh, uh, I want to hear, you know, certainly hear Colvin and the folks want to hear Colvin. Um, we have a, a program called Open Door and everybody knows about Open Door, which um, launched in 2017 to finance the construction of new co-ops and fee simple homes for households earning between 80 percent to 130 percent of ami uh and again it's it's a home ownership opportunity program uh that we are pushing uh they're sold to first-time home buyers who've participated in our home ownership training program we want people to succeed but these are some of the efforts uh, that we are engaged in with many of them, our partners, including the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And it's really interesting hearing uh, the connections and the pathways between affordable rental and then being able to save enough money to be able to reach affordable and accessible home ownership. It's personal to me, Pam. Yes, <laughs> yes, clearly. Um, I have a question for both of you, and I'd like to start with Colvin. One of the key problems facing the affordable housing community is the racial homeownership gap. The center's research shows that following the 2008 crisis, the city lost over 20,000 Black homeowners. These racial disparities in homeownership were made worse by the disproportion and economic impacts of the pandemic on Black and Latino families. What strategies do you think will help existing and prospective homeowners of color catch up? And we'll start with Colvin. Well, um, I'm going to do like the politicians do. I'm not going to answer your question straight away. I'm going to say what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the first thing I want to say is <clears throat> I, I do want to applaud Commissioner Carrion for um, sitting in that seat um, because, um, as you heard and you know, he has a very distinguished career and he has tremendous amount of accomplishments and he's at a point in his life where I'm sure he could have found an easier, more lucrative job. And there's no <laughs> doubt about that. But 
but I'm sure it comes out of this commitment to the residents of New York City that he's sitting there and uh, undertaking what is a very difficult job, especially in this economic environment. I mean, the second thing I want to say is that I'm all in with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods because I think it's a very unique voice, not just in the city of New York, but nationally when it comes to promoting and preserving home ownership for everyone. And I'm very impressed with the Center for taking on issues relating to um, racial disparities in home ownership and, and disparities related to income as well. And the disparities related to income are, are sort of more understandable, but the racial disparities are not well explained. And so I just want to you know, congratulate the center for that and to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because you're making a tremendous contribution to the city. One of the things I want to say is, Commissioner, I, I got really excited about two of your programs that you didn't mention. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually wrote an op-ed, but I couldn't get any of uh, the New York City newspapers to publish it. One is the uh, um, Home First program. Um, I think it's Home First. That's the down that's coming assistance next. Program. Yeah, that's that's uh, coming next. By the way, I got you. <laughs> oh, I, I was okay, but I, I was just super, super um, excited about that. I think um, one of the things about it, um, and I know that you're working with the center on the um, on the down payment assistance navigator program, but uh, your program, which I know you know much better than I do. Um, and I really wanted all New Yorkers to know about it, we really raised the stakes by um, offering up to $100,000 for down payment assistance, which is desperately needed in the city of New York, given the high price of homes. And then the, the, home, the, the, the down payment assistance navigator uh, just allows people more transparency to sort of to negotiate the different criteria for different down payment assistance programs. And then there's a program that you all introduced, um, I believe it was last year, which Restoration really um, had lobbied for and hopes is expanding, which is the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And I, I think that's a breakthrough program because mm -hmm. it, it, it incentivizes, it does two things. One is we know people who um, were living in, uh, with uh, whose home housing costs were being supported by um, Section 8 are always concerned about earning more money because they might have their rent increase and have it increase disproportionately, so much so that it's sometimes it's a disincentive to earning more money, which is un-American. <laughs> That's right. And so um, what this program does is it flips, it takes away the disincentive for earning more money by saying you can keep that differential and it won't your rent won't be raised and not only can you keep it but we're going to put it in a math savings account and help you save mm -hmm. for the acquisition of an asset it might be a home or it might be an education but i think that's you know for me that's a, a systematic a systemic breakthrough because it it really um um, reverses the, the disincentive for people to earn more and to dream bigger and uh, and to and to rise. I'm going to say uh, pursue upward mobility. So I just want to applaud you and HPD for pursuing those those two things. Um, so strategies for the racial wealth gap. <laughs> Closing. When you say close, I think I think I have come to the conclusion after spending a lot of time thinking about this, that closing the racial wealth gap, closing the home ownership gap are distant goals, multi-generational goals, because at this juncture, the, the momentum is negative, right? The gap is widening. And so, I mean, I think our first strategy has to be to try to stop the widening of the goal African 
African Americans have a place from which to launch. But there is so much negative momentum, meaning that the gap is widening, that um, it will take many, many years to close the gap. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be engaged in trying to move in that direction. And as I think about it, it there's so many different causes, as you probably heard during the last day and a half, that um, we really have to have a multi-pronged approach. And I'm sure that you've heard about you know, the burden of uh, student debt. So even those people who are earning an adequate income and who would otherwise qualify may be disqualified because some lenders say that, you know, they treat the student debt in such a way that it becomes disqualifying. Um, we know that there's been wage stagnation. And this is the thing that um, I guess disturbs me about the situation we're in, is I always look at the people who are doing everything right and can't get ahead. And we have a lot of those people in New York City, people who've gone to college, who have decent jobs, um, who work every day. We have people who are essential workers, who, um, who, who have sufficient earnings um, and, and maybe even a fair amount of savings, um, but still can't qualify. And so sorting through all the different causes, whether they're systemic racism or otherwise, what strikes me is what the commissioner said, which is that we have to produce more homes, a, a lot more homes, and, and wrap that with other strategies, such as education, match savings accounts, just a range of things. But I would say the linchpin to this solving this issue, especially a place like New York, is to produce more homes. And that's easier said than done. And we <laughs> probably need a national policy. And I know that the commissioner is knows his way around Washington and he knows his way around Congress. And um, But I think at this point in our nation's history, as well as the history of places like New York, we need to prioritize the production of home ownership uh, on a, at the federal level. And it may not look like home ownership that we've been accustomed to. But the other thing I'll say before I close is in response to this question, is that the commission and I share a history. My parents came from Barbados in the 1950s. Mm. And with $10,000, they were able to buy a brownstone in Clinton Hill. And they were both factory workers at that time. My father had gone to the fifth grade and my mother had gone to the third. She never liked me saying that. But, um, but they, they were well-educated coming out of the British educational system. Um, and they were highly motivated. And their ability to achieve that goal resonated throughout our family, right? And I would say that their ability to do it resonated across generations. But one of the major differences was that there was affordable opportunities for working class people. And I think it was not just a public sector initiative, but companies, private sector, and um, stakeholders understood the poor importance of having home ownership opportunities for their workers. So I think we need a partnership that cuts across the federal government, the city government, and the private sector that focuses on the overall well-being of our residents. Thank you, Colvin. Commissioner, do you have thoughts on this question about racial wealth gap? Oh boy. Speaking of <laughs> things that <laughs> speaking of things that keep us up at night, right? Um you know, when 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 I was a young idealistic person, um, I'm just a little less younger uh, than I than I was then. Um, and and you know, I was dreaming about the America that could be um, as as I was coming up in 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 this city in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. 
into my you know working years, grad school in the 80s, and work life in the 90s and into the 2000s. All along, you know, you're you're thinking and hoping that somehow we've left a lot of junk behind and are advancing as a as a, as a free republic that 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 we're trying to keep as some of our, our founders uh, challenged us. Um, it's a republic if you can keep it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look, you know, as a New York City kid, you, you know about the bad stuff, the ugly stuff of our society. You experience some of it as a, as, as a black and brown person in this country, um, personally, uh, and you fight to remain hopeful. Um, but one of the tragedies that I think we we have experienced in our lifetime is, and I, I grew up in church, so the concept of backsliding, right, was that you somehow are starting to miss the mark. We have backslidden big time in, in this country, uh, unfortunately. We've made progress in a lot of very important areas, but we've also backslidden. Um, and 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 you got to call things what they are, right? I mean, uh, our founding sins are the, is the, and the biggest is the sin of slavery, um, and an occupation and and the pillaging and murder that happened that leaves scars for generations. And then and then we've we built a society around you know uh, essentially white supremacy, and 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 now we're we're still trying to build out of that. We're, we're, you know, um, so the stuff you see in people's lives, the missed opportunities, the redlining that happened in urban America just a few decades ago, that in some cases still happens, um, you know, is 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 the the ripple of of all this stuff that that has that has burdened us. So in our roles, um, and in, in our government roles. You know the the principal responsibility is to tear that tear those barriers down, open up avenues of opportunity for people, and that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I'm I'm so you know in tune with Colvin, and I, I didn't know he was from the Caribbean, but then I, there was a slight accent somewhere in there that I would hear certain words and say, this brother's gotta be from the Caribbean. And now I know we are Antillanos, we're both from the Caribbean. Um, similar stories. Um, one of the things that was a breakthrough for this Caribbean family was the ability to put a down payment down on a home, you know? And so I was reserving the home first, um, program to talk about it in the context of the racial disparities and you know we've we've uh, our program uh, for first time home buyers has leveraged more than 50 million dollars to help over 3000 low to moderate income families achieve the dream of home ownership um we've we've backed it up with money with more money now and so our, our plan is to, to provide 300 families a year with up to, as uh, Colvin announced and uh, uh, mentioned, $100,000. I think we were somewhere at 50 or $60,000, correct me if I'm wrong, um, now able to give a family this assistance so that they can begin to build family wealth. And then working with our other suite of programs support that investment because it is an investment in that family's future. And, you know, we, we announced the blueprint, the housing blueprint is really about, in this case, working to increase the, you know, uh, the annual budget for home first, provide more assistance. That was sort of the general uh, objective of, of uh, in the blueprint. We're putting money behind this to support families and have them be able to to enter home ownership and create wealth. Um, uh, Colvin mentioned uh, Washington DC and navigating that place down there uh, so that we can deliver here. 
And we are literally yesterday, we had a, a strategy session with uh, our partners at the Housing Development Corporation and the folks that do our federal advocacy. We're planning. I'm going down there personally to meet with members in both the House and Senate side. Uh, we have a very clear agenda about what we need. We understand that the tax credit uh, is, is, a, is a public private partnership that works. We've seen it generate thousands and thousands of opportunities around the country. We need, we need uh, more tax, uh, tax credit capacity. We need more, uh, the ability uh, uh, to, 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 to have more capital to spend on, on housing. So uh, obviously the rental assistance, all of it is a, is a package that will help us to break the back of this of this thing that is holding us back and, and holding so many people back. And, and I'm glad that um, Colvin brought up the um, uh, family self-sufficiency program. Talk about broken things, right? We, we tell a family, you're in trouble financially. You know what? We have a program for you. The government is here to help you. Here's a, 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 a rent voucher. Um, now, you know, let's see if you can paste the rest of your life together you know, get the education and training you need, find a job, do this, do that. Um, meanwhile, you're raising kids. And and then we will, uh, and, and then you're going to be okay, right? But you can't increase your income and you can't save and you can't do this. Um, that program allows us to remove that barrier, help a family save money and prepare for the launch, prepare for the launch. My my two Puerto Rican parents, teenagers in the 1950s, 60s, in their 20s, were born. Our journey begins. That union produced 10 grandchildren. The expectation now in my family, and, in, and my hope is that we can infuse this everywhere, the expectation, you educate yourself, you go to school, you, you, you build your family's capacity to participate in this economy, and you're a participating, uh, contributing citizen to the American experiment. We have to do this. We have to do this. And one way to do it is to deal with this insidious uh, racial wealth gap that we've allowed to persist for too long. Pam, can I ask a question? <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to ask the commissioner a question because I, I, I read today a couple of things in preparation for this. Mm -hmm. One was that um, 70, I was like 74% of Americans, this is a poll done by bank rate, said mm -hmm. that, and, and New York might be a little different, but 74% of, of Americans said that owning a home was a more significant achievement than success in their career, raising a family, just a whole range of things. It was like the highest, well, how did they say it? They said, it's the most significant measure of achievement, right? Wow, wow. And, and, um, and New York might be a little different because home ownership rate you know, is, is lower in New York. But I think um, just from a sort of, public policy perspective, what we know is that a lot of our working and middle-class people are desire to own a home. And, and what I see in a lot of communities is a hollowing out of the middle because they're not able to own a home. And the middle class is obvious, obviously, and the working class obviously, uh, frequently um, very active in the community, in the schools, you know, on the playgrounds, <laughs> in the fields, you know, uh, volunteering and churches and all that other stuff. Just so from a, you know, from a community building perspective, you know, it's just important that we have a strategy to keep those people and, and they're very, very oftentimes interested in home ownership and being a part of the growth of the city, right? And so when you're in a city where you see asset values growing and you're locked out of it, it's demoralizing. And the first thing you wanna do is get the heck out of there, right? And go someplace where you can 
enjoy the growth that you see all around you. So the question I want to ask you is, um, has to do with that, but it also has to do, and I shouldn't ask a compound question. It also, <laughs> it also has to do whether, whether you see any possibility that um, the private sector in the real estate industry, I was reading an article about um, a real estate board in Minneapolis who, who sort of um, apologized for their role in discriminating in mm. housing and are launching programs um, to try to address that. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether you see any possibility around that um, in New York, um, where the private sector will get, will take more responsibility for correcting the injustices. Uh -huh. That, that's a good question, Colvin, and I do. I'm optimistic about that. Uh, I know a lot of the folks in the real estate community. Um, you know, the, 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 the big New York real estate families have, um, as they've diversified their portfolios away from just commercial assets to other lines of business, have also discovered the affordable housing. Um, they also have become advocates for affordable housing because they realize that in order to have a workforce that drives an economy for a global city, that workforce needs to have a higher quality of life and an affordable uh, rent price or purchase price so that they can live in the city that they work in to sustain the businesses that create this amazing tax base that drives this very large uh, municipal budget that we have to do all the stuff that we have to do. Um, and so, you know, um, a, one of the key people in the administration that's working on these types of partnerships is uh, Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright, who's responsible for, uh, the mayor gave her the charge of, of creating these kinds of public-private partnerships with the corporate community here in New York City. Um, you know, the complicity of the of the real estate and banking community to discrimination, marginalizing communities, disinvestment is very clear. You know, a lot of a lot of literature supports it. Uh, the facts are there. Those are in, indisputable facts. Owning up to that reality um, of racism, classism is something very important uh, to allow healing and progress to occur. And I think that's something that um, this administration is definitely committed to working on. Um, coincidentally, um, and, and let me just say something about these, this poll, because I think that I'm not surprised that it's 74% of Americans who say well, owning a home, owning a home could be the biggest accomplishment for me, because it. it, it we're rooted in this concept of an American dream, which is, you know, to own a piece of it, literally own it with your family and trade it and hand it off and leverage it and borrow against its value and all these things. I mean, people have financed college educations with the, with, with the, with the leverage of a home, which is unfortunate, those are, those are bigger issues, but that's the kind of flexibility it gives you. And then you said you said you said something very important about the the participation of of homeowners and the moderate and middle income New Yorkers in their communities, creating stability. There is a certain amount of healthy self interest in owning a home, right? You want its value to re to remain strong because your family is tied to it, your finances are tied to it, the stability of your of your environment is is tied to it. So you want it to be safe, you want it to be stable. You want it to work literally, functionally, and mechanically, um, and and then you, you want to protect all those pieces, and and so you participate in the civic conversation, right? You show up to board meetings. The community board becomes important to you because, like, hey, there's an issue on my block. I I want to make sure that I'm part of that conversation. That's not unique to homeowners, let me just say, but but it's a it's an important ingredient in creating stability of neighborhood, uh, participation in neighborhood life, 
Um, and if you go across the city, I mean, Monday, coincidentally, Monday night, I'm, I'm, we're having a town hall meeting around the Nehemiah houses issue and the infrastructure issues related to that. There's a lot of them, but Congress member ha Hakeem Jeffries and Congress member Yvette Clark and local assembly member Nikki Lucas and local state senator, um, uh, I'll remember her name. She's gonna, she's gonna hold this against me. Um, uh, have all gathered that community come to us and said, things are broken and they, they need to be fixed. Latrice Walker? Latrice Walker's part of, yeah, part of that. Um, and, and Senator Persaud also, yeah. And so, so um, we're, we're having a town hall meeting with the Nehemiah homeowners um, to answer some important questions. But the fact that they all got together, they went to their elected officials, the elected officials came to them, to us with them and the mayor and the commissioner and DEP and DOB and all this interagency effort to stabilize a community, to help them. And we're here to provide that, you know, the, the home fix support and, and, the, and the counseling and wherever it's needed. But the, the power of that neighborhood to come together and those homeowners that guess what? They were entrance into affordable home ownership, and now they are a force for Queens and Brooklyn and 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 our city. That's important. That's that's building community. Thank you so much for those uh, policy as well as individual stories. It's uh, true New York stories here about home ownership. We have just a few minutes left. Um, I'd like to ask Colvin, based on your long time roots in a very specific community, we've got just a couple minutes about what you think a missing ingredient is to support New Yorkers, um, to support communities that enable all New Yorkers to flourish because you've been working particularly in a particularly local place. What do you think is missing? Wow, that's a that's a <laughs> difficult question. Um, I think there's a honestly, I think there's a lot of apathy. Um, I think people are discouraged. I was just part of a conversation, and Commissioner, you might want to hear this <laughs> or not, um, where people don't think that government's listening to them, and and these are New Yorkers, and this came up in the context of a. Uh, the placement of a public plaza. And so um, I, I think that New Yorkers, and I know that the city has done a, a lot to try to listen, but it doesn't always, people don't always see the results of that in the output from the city. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, more tangible demonstration that the city and the state hear the desires and wishes of the residents. And I know that there's a lot of disparate voices, but for the most part, there is consensus around what's important to New Yorkers. And so I, that's what I would say, that's my response. Thank you so much, uh, holding the commissioner's feet to the fire. <laughs> As it were, for our fireside chat. Well, listen, let me just take the, uh, that opportunity, that opening that you gave me, because, you know, I'm a city planner by profession. And one of the things that I said to folks when I arrived here was, um, we are a planning agency. The Department of City, city Planning is a, is, a, is a planning agency from a zoning and land use perspective. Um, they, they look at the, you know, the, the envelopes within which we can do t things. They set the rules. And we, you know, we're dealing with the bigger questions of equity and carrying the, the, the responsibility of creating affordable housing for more New Yorkers in the mayor's a city of yes initiative, which, which is a, a look at a zoning code so that we can um, unleash development uh, around the city, both in terms of the production of housing and economic activity. But what we do, our planning role as HPD is to sit with neighborhoods 
and plan their future and 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 look at what are the ingredients that are missing where's what's up with the open space why is it not there and is there school capacity and and we work very closely with the department of city planning to do that but but engaging um the local community in that conversation uh this opens up a, a pandora's box because we're also having discussions with communities that don't don't want to see change right like the Bruckner rezoning that we just did, that we passed and got through the city council, the community response there was, no, we don't want change, leave us alone. Um, we did the Edgemere uh, uh, rezoning. Big opportunity to create a lot of housing in the Rockaways. Um, there was some resistance there, but having the conversation is absolutely essential for our future. And it, it, I still consider it an important miss missing ingredient that we are ramping up. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of people's time and give us time to go over to closing remarks, but I just want to thank Colvin and the commissioner so much for your thoughts and insights and uh, talking about some of the great work that we're all doing together. Thank you. So thank I'll you. turn it back to Dakari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you, Colvin and Commissioner Kerry Kedion, for that thoughtful discussion. It really has me thinking ahead about what's possible. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. It's been a pleasure to serve as your MC for the third year running, and making sure your time at our summit was enjoyable and inspiring. Yeah, chances for me now to say uh, my, my thank yous as well. Uh, I just wanted to add my thank yous to Commissioner Kedion and Colvin for that incredible conversation. Um, I'm so inspired by your, um, your personal dedication and your family's histories. And uh, Commissioner, I know you said that when your uh, family came, they were ready to step up and the city stepped up. And uh, I'm hearing you, we're collectively ready to step up and face these complicated uh, issues that we've all been talking about over the past couple of days uh, and really um, do the work that needs to be done from the North Bronx all the way to the tip of the Rockaways, um, uh, we're, we're ready uh, and we're gonna step up. So uh, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, thank you for your inspiration. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to um, check out the work of Vanessa Perry, please do. She is also incredibly brilliant. Uh, and she also shared her personal story and provide a very, very human focused uh, framework for how to anchor our conversations and how to focus us as we think about this really complicated and difficult work ahead. Um, but uh, again, to some of the points that we're, we just heard, we really do have to focus on supply and making sure that that's an option in these community conversations. Uh, so uh, to all of our amazing moderators and panelists, thank you for your time, your brilliance, uh, your incredibly collaborative conversations. I learned so much and I hope you all did as well. I also want to thank every single person who tuned in, our attendees for your time, your engagement, your inspiring ideas, and a huge thank you to Jakari for doing such an amazing job as our uh, MC and as a leader at the center. And finally, uh, to our sponsors and supporters, uh, without whom today would not be possible, thank you so much, uh, especially our lead supporters, Wells Fargo and City, along with many other generous sponsors. Uh, please share everything that you've learned, you've thought about, all the work we need to do ahead over the next year and uh, into the future uh, for both affordable homeownership and all of our, you know, dreams for our thriving neighborhoods in New York City. Thank you for being part of our amazing community uh, focused on this work and an incredible conversation. Have a great evening and we'll see you next year in person. Thanks again. <laughs>